one thing I try to keep in mind is like, even though they were building there, they're a character, there's history to them. You know, someone had to have built them at some point in time. And, and like that kind of influences even the way you design and the way you paint. If you're building something older, like maybe the boards weren't super straight. And so, you know, they're a little crooked and they're a little like off kilter and, you know, they're slightly different colors. And, and all that little stuff goes a long way into like, you know, really showing, you know, life. This is the Pencil Kings podcast where we talk to artists from all over the world and listen to their stories and see what they're working on, what they have to say about their art and art industry in general. Today, we're talking to Brandon Pike. I know that a lot of people would love to do artwork in the same style that Brandon uh, has. Very fun, uh, elongated, cartoony characters, but they're also rendered very nicely. How are you doing today? Ah, great. Glad to be talking with you and glad to say hello to everybody. Look forward to talking. (laughs) Awesome. I'm really interested to dive into your style and actually like the techniques or some of the hurdles that you might have gone through to get to where you are because it just, it feels so polished and the characters feel so alive and I'm really envious because I wish I could do work like this. Let's start at the beginning. Did you always know you wanted to be an artist? How did your particular path to becoming an artist look like? Sure, yeah. Uh, I think ever since I was a little kid, uh, that's when I, I get interested in drawing. Um, really, like the big turning point for me was I was probably around five years old when I first saw Batman the animated series, and uh, seeing like Bruce Timm's work and you know all the guys that worked on that show, you know that was when I really started. I'm like, I want to do that, and I started drawing and I was, you know, looking at the uh, stuff that was in the comics, and I'm like, oh man, this is this is awesome, and that really kind of set my journey off and. You know, ever since that point, I just kind of wanted to pursue it. For me, I was uh, very similarly inspired. I can't remember exactly what the animation was. I know that uh, N- the Ninja Turtles cartoon was very big uh, when I was five. Mm-hmm. I think the the original Ninja Turtles cartoon, and um, and uh, as well as comic books. So I, you know, I got how to draw comics the Marvel way, and I started tracing these things, and I started drawing my own characters, and then I tried doing animation, and that was just punishing. <laughs> Um, so, some things would turn out okay, but you know, all my characters were always like in the same pose, standing straight on, sure. you know, <laughs> facing directly at the viewer. Going way, way back mm-hmm. to when you were a kid, how did you get into this? Um, what did you do? I think like what I first started it was like doing, doing master studies when you're a kid. You know, there'd be like the pose of him on a cover, and, you know, jumping towards the camera or something, and I just practice and I practice like I think what made that show so great is it had such distinct shapes yeah and so Batman had such a iconic look so I think like I really tried to practice that it was the same thing with the Joker you know getting the eyes getting those triangles right and getting that swoop of the hair and like all those things and I just kept practicing that over and over again so even when you were that young, like you had the idea of drawing in terms of shapes, because that was something that, you know, eluded me for a long time to break things down and, and make it a lot more simplified. Yeah, I think that's kind of always how I've seen it is uh, it's just always been shapes within shapes. Um, you know, even back then, like if I was drawing someone like Darth Vader, it was the same thing. Like, I think that's why I found stuff like that so appealing. It's just it fascinated me seeing the relationship of like all these shapes together within the larger one. And, uh, you know, for a long time, like, I don't think I understood that. Like, I think that it was one of those things that I was really drawn to, but it took like going through all the motions and going through like all the training in order to finally look back and be like, Oh, that's what I was paying attention to. Like, that's what I found so appealing at the time. Gotcha. That's really cool. And so then going through uh, elementary school and high school, were you always that art kid, um, the, the guy that's always drawing, or did you kind of fall <laughs> off the, the track a little bit? How dedicated were you to your art? Did it uh, carry through all the way through high school? Oh yeah. Yeah. I, th- I think I was always the kid drawing in the corner and like, that was kind of always the thing that was consistent. When I got older and started to delve into like realism a little bit more, like I think like junior high and started like doing portraits a little bit more and, and that sort of thing. And that ended up leading to like some murals for the local movie theater in my town in high school. That is a place where everything changed a lot for me because I'd been used to doing just art on my own. And all of a sudden, like they're like, hey, we want to do a mural for the upcoming Harry Potter movie. And want you to paint it. It was really the first time that I'd actually done like a ton of painting. I don't know what I was thinking. I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure. I can do that. And, uh, it was, it was really crazy because you're painting on such a large scale 
But I think like I learned a lot doing that. And then by the time I was done, which was, I think I started when I was 14. I think the last one I did, I was like 22, but I learned so much. I think there was like 19 murals by the time I was done. So like every year they would just hire you again to paint whatever the big blockbuster movie was that summer? Yeah, like sometimes. I remember at one point on one side of the wall, it was like The Matrix. (laughs) Then on the other, I think it was like Shrek. So it was, uh, they'd go and they'd roll over it after the season and then I'd pick up and do another one. Are you from a small town or are you from a a larger place? Oh yeah, I'm from a small town in Maine. Did you ever feel stuck? Like you just didn't have any opportunities or you didn't know where you were going to go? It's not like there's Maine is a hotbed of no. the, the um, visual community. Yeah, yeah. No, I, yeah, I really didn't know. Like, you know, when you're starting to try to figure that stuff out and it's, I knew that I loved to draw, but I, I honestly didn't know what I could do. I knew like, you know, there's guys that were painters and stuff. I think it was in the movie theater, actually, like sweeping up some popcorn and uh, it was in the Lord of the Rings and the credits were rolling and there was all the drawings at the end of Return of the King. And then I remember seeing like, it was like a concept artist. And that was kind of my first exposure to like, oh man, that's, yeah, there's artists out there doing this. And like, that kind of was when I realized that there, there might be something somewhere else all of a sudden your eyes open that there's a whole big world out there full of opportunity, I guess. I think it, I breathe it. Look out of the way. For you, where anybody sees only a drop of water rolling down the window, I see a universe of beings animated with all the passions common to physical life. Uh, when I've talked to different people, they don't realize how much opportunity there is and how big these art teams are that put together a movie. I remember the moment I was at a drive-in theater with my parents and my brother, I realized the concept of an actor. And I was like, hey, I've seen this guy before. <laughs> you know, like, there's just this realization. Another realization that people don't have is, you know, sitting through the credits and looking at what those art teams are, how big they are, and how many different positions there are. And maybe then even going one step further and actually looking up what some of these uh, art jobs actually are. Because I've never sat and done it myself, but I just know that Mm -hmm. there are a ton of them. Oh, it's crazy. Like uh, things you would never expect. Even when you're in school, you think of like concept artists and stuff like that. But as soon as you get into the industry, it's crazy because it's like just concept artists. But then there's like guys who specialize on visual development and guys that specialize on just production art. So it's like a different quality and like, it, it's crazy the amount of different positions and opportunities there really are. Well, how about for the listeners, can you just break those three positions down that you mentioned concept artists, visual mm-hmm. development artists, and production artists, I think was the third one. Concept can mean a lot of different things in a lot of different places. Like at the place I'm currently at, it's very much big ideas regarding games and like a lot of times to me concept art is very loose, gestural, and it's very idea based. You know, you're really trying to like capture the essence of things quickly. A lot of times like pieces wouldn't be as refined and tight because you're really just trying to convey a message. Like visual development, in my experience, it's a little more involved in the sense that like, you know, you're really trying to hone in on which visuals are really going to sell a style. Say you're doing like a target piece for a character, you know, you're really trying to nail down the aesthetic for each of these things. And then like a production artist would come in and like really once the style is kind of set up and like you have a basic view of what's going on, they'll come in and they'll do the assets. So it's like if you're making a game again, they'll come in and, and do your buildings and their concepts will be a lot tighter and a lot more refined. Very nice breakdown. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Just speaking to ego a little bit, do you think there's more prestige at one point in that pipeline than the other? Because I was always a production artist and I always felt like so proud of the work that I was doing. But, you know, I never really had to come up with too many of my own ideas. There's obviously creative problem solving at all levels, but usually you're just handed a model sheet and it's like, go. Um, It's largely someone else's creative idea that you're working on. You know, each section of that pipeline, you know, every, every part is so crucial. It's like hard for anyone to really come in and say like, oh, you know, this was my big grand vision and stuff. Because really, like, you know, you can have such a good idea on your own, but like with a team, you have a a great idea. You know, everyone adds like their little element to it. And it really like, then it becomes everybody's. And I think that's like, that's the beauty about working in a team. There's going to be guys that just think of things you never even know. And it's like, you can start with something in the initial concepts and the, the really early stages And it's really brilliant. But then by the time you get to the production, they could have added stuff that made it just, you know, out of this world. That's the awesome thing about working in 
in a production pipeline. Man, you have way less ego than I do. And I, I really <laughs> appreciate your answer because I think that's a that's definitely the right way to look at it. Is, you know, this is big team <laughs> collaborative effort and you know everybody um, is playing their part and, and without one stage then it's kind of like everything yeah. else suffers. You graduated uh, high school, and then you went to art college. Yes. Is that correct, or yeah, what was the timeline? Uh, I graduated in high school in 2006, and then immediately, like that summer, I came to. I went out to San Francisco and went to the Academy of Art, and and started right up in the fall. All right. So, a little backstory: Academy of Art in San Francisco was the school that I wanted to go to. Being from Canada, I got the literature and the pamphlets and whatnot, and I saw that the tuition costs were around $40,000. And that was just for the tuition that didn't cover your rent. It didn't cover your food. It didn't cover entertainment. So I just immediately dismissed it because of being very limited and feeling like I don't know how I could ever consider coming up with that kind of money. And the school that I went to cost like $4,000 a year. So about one tenth of the price. Now, I think Academy of Art would have been a far better education. Obviously, you weren't out of country. But uh, what was your take on that um, when you were considering going uh, to that school? Price is astronomical. Like I, I remember looking at it, and I'm like, I, I had no idea how I was how I was going to do it. At the end of the day, it was like coming out here and seeing it and seeing the work on the walls. I'm like, it, it just seemed like something I had to do. So I'll be paying it off with student loans for <laughs> the rest of my life. <laughs> but um, I think at the end of the day, like you know, it was worth it. Like it was it was a great school. I got a really good education, and to this day, it's daunting. I mean. You know, I'm still paying on it every month, and uh, which certainly wouldn't change a thing. I'm glad that. Really, like you, you don't think that there was any alternate paths that you could have taken. Like I know that there's a ton of value of going to school and being in a, a creative environment, and especially if you have access to top tier mentors. You know, like one of the things that I I felt with Pencil Kings is that we are trying to bridge the gap between professionals teaching and people See, who can get affordable art training um, if they can't go you know sure. maybe they physically can't go to the school or, or just financially they Absolutely. can't do it. so i should i should elaborate that on, on that a little bit more like at the time when I, I was coming out of school like again i was from a really small town so i really didn't know as many education opportunities as like i think there are my exposure was fairly limited when i made that decision like i feel strongly that at the end it, it was the right thing at the time i think it's amazing now because you're seeing all these sites and all these opportunities pop up for like, you know, what you're doing, you know, connecting the professionals to students and people who just want to learn. And it, I think there's so many more now. I mean, it's astounding. Honestly, you can go out and and learn stuff just from websites and just from contacting professionals. And, it, you know, at the end of the day, it's the portfolio that matters. I mean, it's, it's great to have the degree and you know, if, if that's something that you're interested in, that's something that means a lot to you. But I think it's it's almost more valuable to get that mentorship. If you look back at like artists, you know, through the years and stuff, you know, mentorship is really where you uh, you get the most experience. So I think there, there's benefit to going to school if that's an opportunity that you want to take and that you have. But I think now, you know, in the state that we're in, I think there are so many more options. And I think, like, it's up to you to find the best one that, you know, works. But I think, like, uh, it's definitely a rich, rich uh, field right now. It's getting easier and easier to mm-hmm. connect the dots, like who the right person is to talk to. There's more people coming online because even though like, the internet is not a new thing, but people are, you know, there's still so many artists, I'm sure, that don't even have a yeah. website. But, you know, slowly these people are, you know, they get enough nudges and then they, finally they come online like, oh, man, I can't believe this guy has never had a website and yeah. I've been <laughs> reading his comic books for the last 20 years and now he finally has a website and I, and with a contact thing, and I can reach out and just say thanks for all the, you know, the great times I've had reading Absolutely. Um, his true work. I have something more, something none of your dry as dust professors and routine written doctors have: love, devotion, passion. Let's talk a little bit now about your style because it's got a very uh, storybook kind of quality. And is this something that's you know, from your early Batman days, is this something that just carried through or was it intentional? 
I'd love for you to just walk us through because I know a lot of people have asked me about how do you come up with your style and it's just a recurring question. So when I saw your work, I was just really excited because I feel like it's going to connect with so many people. Oh, thanks a lot. Yeah, I, I think there's always been that kind of style kind of lurking in the background, you know, ever since those early days when I was doing murals and when I was doing stuff like I had a turn where I was a lot more realistic when I was going out and sketching and stuff like I was you know, I felt like there were a lot of rules that I had to follow. And, I, you know, and a lot of that could have come from school where it's like, you know, you really have to pay attention to the realism and stuff. It's almost like there was just this weight that was kind of like resting. I felt like I was missing something. And I, I would go to do personal work and stuff. And I really, I didn't feel inspired. And, you know, I saw all this amazing work out there. And, you know, I just didn't feel like I like I was seeing things the same way. I think it started to slip out when I went into games, my first job. There I saw all these artists and they were drawing completely different from one another. All of a sudden you're like, oh my God, like this guy's doing this over here. And I started to like, you know, look at my own work and start to look at things around me. And I'm like, you know, I, the shape stuff started to kind of slip in again. And I'd start to look and be like, oh, you know, it's really interesting because everything is kind of in these geometric forms. And, you know, and that's when I started to pay a lot more attention to like, you know, oh, when you stylize like, you know, a leg, like, you know, I know that there's an S curve that runs through it and stuff, but you know, what, what happens when you just taper two lines, you know, you start to look at faces, you know, how do I interpret this? Well, it's like, at the end of the day, you try to break things up into just iconic forms. You know, I always like use road signs as a really great example, right? Like, because like, you'll have a uh, kid's crossing or kid's playing. It's two really simple silhouettes, but like you kind of understand what it is. Or if it's like train tracks up ahead, it's like, oh, you know, train tracks, it's, you know, two, uh, two vertical lines and then a bunch of horizontal lines. And I think like that kind of mentality started to play into, you know, the way I started to draw things, or at least I try to keep in the background, you know, while I'm drawing what I'm thinking about. So it's like, you know, really stripping things down to their essence and then bringing detail back in. For instance, if you're drawing like like an eagle or like a, a bird of some kind and stuff, it's like it's really like interpreting like, okay, well, we, I know that the beak's important. So, you know, you get this triangle right here and I know like, you know, the wings are important. So it's like really like a half circle. And it's really like breaking things up into their really basic shapes and then bringing the detail back in, you know, where necessary. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, it, it does. But I've never heard anyone explain it in that way like what's unique about what you just said is how you're seeing the world always in terms of shapes like shapes that just fit together like i'm looking at your website here and there's two cats riding a motorcycle yeah and just as you're explaining this what i'm now seeing is like you know circle mm -hmm. curve square um leaf shape <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know what you yeah. call that but for where I'm at now in in seeing through these these new eyes that you've just kind of allowed me to to get a glimpse of how you see the world, all I can really focus on is the motorcycle and the background elements, mm -hmm. and the cats are their own thing. I feel like those are more complex shapes, but the motorcycle, the trees, the leaves, the the smoke, it's all very easy to see how it fits together. That's a, a good piece to talk about, I think, because the whole point is balancing like organic shapes versus geometric shapes, but also making sure that you find the order in the chaos, if you will. If you look at a forest and you don't look at all the detail and you just like abstract, you know, what it, it's just tall vertical lines. And like, even with a motorcycle, it's like, you know, I took some liberties and stuff because I'm really just wanted to give you that initial feeling when it comes to the cats. Like I still treat them the same way. Like if you look at the black cat, like she's, She's got like a diamond head with these triangles on her ears. And then it's like, it's a half circle that makes the stomach and, you know, and then like, I'll start to push things like, because they're a bit more organic and they have life. Um, so that's when it's, you can start to, um, at least in my work, like I try to play things up a little bit more, uh, but it's still treating them the same way that I would like break up the motorcycle or, or the leaves. And, and it's all, it's all about balance, right? It's like, if you have all the order in the background and all the trees and the very vertical and stuff, well, then that's when you can inject some of the more organic leaf shapes to kind of balance things out. So you're getting a little bit of both so that the eye can, you know, rest. And also like, it feels complete when you look like that. So it's so great. And, and I, <laughs> I love it. And I feel like now I could go and look at a lot of art. It's then, crazy talk. <laughs> well, I guess a little bit, but at the same time, it's not like if this helps you with your art, try it out and see if you can just start abstracting things down to their most basic shapes instead of thinking of them as whole objects. Just think of them as a collection of shapes and how are those shapes arranged and how are they placed in relation 
to each other. And um, then together it makes something beautiful. Well, even in your buildings, there's just like this character and vibrant feeling of life. I, I don't know how to ex explain what I'm seeing, but, you know, you could draw your characters in, in very static poses, but they feel very relatable and, and alive. And um, it's not just the characters. It's also the buildings, too. They feel very alive. They're, you know, they are stylized. Um, but what, what can you tell us about that? Because I feel like that's another thing that's very difficult for people to, to grasp. But um, clearly, you do have a, a good hold of it. Oh, well, thanks. I certainly try. Um, lo like looking at the buildings in particular, in theory, they have no life. You know, a building's a building, right? One thing I try to keep in mind is like, even though they are a building, they're, they're a character. There's history to them. You know, someone had to have built them at some point in time. And, and like that kind of influences even the way you design and the way you paint. If you're building something older, like maybe the boards weren't super straight. And so, you know, they're a little crooked and they're a little like off kilter and, you know, they're slightly different colors. And, and all that little stuff goes a long way into like, you know, really showing, you know, life. I think it's like people. It's like some people have freckles and, you know, everyone's got different hair and like there's all this stuff that like when you put all the parts together again, like it, it makes you you. There's a story in each of these these things. If you do have a character that's like a static pose, it's still all about like the relationship of all these little parts together. It's like, what kind of clothes are they wearing? And like, you know, what is the expression on their face? You know, that stuff kind of important, even if they're standing still, you know, are they looking at you? Are they looking away from you? You know, as, a, as like a viewer and like all that stuff, I think putting it together, it gives it that, those little hints of life. You know, when you're walking down the street and it's like all this architecture and stuff around you, it's like, you can see, like, oh, yeah, this building was built in the 20s, and then this building came along, and they built it last year. And, like, look at the difference. And stuff. But, like, I think that's what gives it this kind of exciting kind of quality. And I think, like, trying to inject that into your work a little bit kind of helps. That's great. How long are you spending on some of these pieces? Because uh, sort of a, a roadblock that I feel that people have is feeling like, you know, you're not getting ahead, you're not making progress, and yet maybe you only spent 45 minutes on a drawing or a, a digital painting when in reality it's taking much, much longer for some of these pieces. So how long would you spend on, on this, this particular piece? It, that was broken up over several nights. It was three or four nights and I was probably putting like three or four hours into each night. So you're probably around like 12 to 16 hours from start to finish from like concept to completion. It, it ranges, right? I think I always try and give myself a little bit of a time cap because I think that just comes from working in the industry. Like I know that I can't spend like forever, but like certain things more attention than others. It's good to try and find that balance. And a lot of times, like you know, I'll be sitting with these things and I'll be like halfway through, and I'm like, what am I doing right now? Like this is this is terrible. Like, but that's the part where you have to like just keep pushing with it. And it's like, no, just a little further. Like, you know, then you step back and you think about it and it's like, you know, what about the initial idea did I like that I'm missing at this stage in the game? And how do I get that back? And it's, it, you know, each painting is its own kind of journey. And I think like just depending on the message that you're trying to sell or, you know, the story or whatnot, like, you know, it really helps dictate the time. Okay, so that, that was a great answer, like 12 to 16 hours. So if you're listening to this and you, and you go to Brandon's website, kind of gives you an idea of how much time is being put into this. And while you're working, you, you were talking about how you might be halfway through and you feel like you're not making the progress that you want. Is it like, let's just take, uh, let's just say this took you 10 hours so we can use 10 as, a, as an easier to work with number. Mm -hmm. But is it like everything kind of comes together in those final two hours? No, yeah, ab absolutely. Like, I think, uh, I, I think like a, a lot of that time, in a lot of ways, it's prep. It's, you know, making sure you have the right research. It's making sure you have the right overall idea. And then like the shape, you know, there's a lot of growing pain doing that first 75%. Like you're really, you know, trying to um, get a handle on this stuff. And then I think those final two hours that, you know, that's when you got your foundations, like you've got all your parts and now it's like, you know, how do I push, push and pull this a little bit? And like, you know, what happens when I put a little light over here? How does that affect this? And like, that's, I, that's always like really fun. I always feel like, I'm almost like on fire running and screaming for the first like 75% uh, of the painting. And then, you know, the last little chunk, that's when it's like, oh, okay, no, no, no. Like this is, this works. And that kind of can wrap it all up. 
Awesome. For me, the big takeaway and, and for people listening, I think is just, you know, if you're if you're frustrated with your work, if you're at an hour and you don't like something, you know, keep pushing, go to two hours, go to three hours, go to um, six hours, go to 10 hours and see where you're at with one yeah. piece and see how that looks compared to the work that you've done previously. Um, because this is something that I've heard consistently over and over again. People say, normally I would spend... 16 hours, you know, a whole week on one piece. But for the sake of this uh, lesson, I'm just doing one hour so that I can break it down and show you the most important parts. You know, I feel frustrated with my results that they're not happening fast enough. But the sort of realistic view is that this is art, you know, art is art and um, (laughs) can't rush art and it takes time. I mean, it's obviously good to keep deadlines in mind because if you want to be, have a professional career, those, that, those deadlines are going to be very important to you, but um, it just takes a long time to get a very nice result and there's no real shortcut around it. No, absolutely. I like mileage is, one of the most crucial parts I think to drawing is it's like, you know, putting that time in and like knowing that like, you know, the, and, and it's one of those things that's really rewarding because the more time you put in and the more you keep doing it, like the more, the faster you'll end up getting and you'll be able to think through different parts quicker. And, you know, of course each thing is unique, but it really like time and mileage are just critical. All right, Brandon, uh, let's wrap this up. Uh, where can people find you online? You can find me at brandonpikeart.blogspot.com. Uh, I'm on Facebook under Brandon Pike Art, on Instagram, and all the hotspots as much as I can. So I'm, I'm certainly around. How do you manage all of that? Because for me, like even just email is, I feel like I'm often drowning in email. But you know, with all these different social media properties, how do you keep up with it all? I think email is certainly the worst one. But uh, I having a consistency across my my site so it's like if i'm posting something like i just run down the line and just post it through the different different channels and do it all at the same time and i think it helps a little bit because i i think i would get extremely overwhelmed otherwise definitely all right well that's it for this episode we will have show notes for this as usual at pencilkings.com slash brandon dash pike that's b-r-a-n-d-o-n dash p-i-k-e Uh, Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. Bye, Brandon. Thank you. Don't demand patience, skill, years of practice. Ah, you talk like a fool. I would trade a century of practice for an ounce of inspiration. That does it for another episode of the Pencil Kings podcast. If you'd like to check us out and see more about what we do, head on over to PencilKings.com. You can check us out on Facebook, Twitter, or everywhere. And, well, that's it. <laughs>